start off by saying I'm actually not going to talk economics. Uh, there's no need because ESA Home Loans puts out, I think, a very good economics uh, bulletin uh, every month. And you're all welcome to keep one of those <coughs> deals with GDP, inflation, interest rate expectations, exchange rates, price of oil. Our view, is our house view, obviously, not necessarily the same house view uh, that others may have. So I'm not going to focus on economics, although there is obviously an economic thrust behind a heck of a lot of what I'm going to say. <coughs> Everybody will recognize um, that front slide, Mind of a Fox. I think we've all heard Ken Sunter with his great presentations. He focuses on the fox because he says it's the fox that's agile. The fox has got beady eyes, clear eyes, has this amazing way of being able to sum up the varying scenarios and determine the best course of action, whether the fox is hunting or in fact even in defense. I'm not going to talk about the mind of the fox because I don't think that, that is applicable to running our own businesses. But I'm going to talk about something else. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> like a squirrel. <laughs> All right. So, but let me tell you, this isn't a joke. Squirrel. Because I think there are many, many characteristics of a squirrel that we should actually take note of and maybe try and parallel in our own, diet, in, in our own lives. Let's talk about some of them. Firstly, a squirrel is always aware of its own environment and, more importantly, the changes in that environment. Always. They practice moderation, even when pickings are easy. When the grass below the trees flooded with nuts, they still practice moderation. They're conservative when borrowing in times of crisis. What I mean by that is they can actually have a crisis. Electricity might strike, strike their tree. The tree could be chopped down. They have to go and partner with somebody else. They will have moderate pickings on the other person's store of nuts. And they always store for the future, saving in other words. So let's see these four characteristics which I'm going to talk about this evening. Environmental awareness, moderation, conservative borrowing, and saving for the future. Those are all characteristics of a squirrel. So let's talk about environmental awareness. Getting back to the squirrel, you'll notice that a squirrel's nose never stops twitching. Its eyes never stop moving as it remains acutely aware of every aspect of its environment. If it senses danger, it's up the tree straight away. It knows what's happening. It knows if there's food. It never stops assessing what's happening in the environment. So let's us do an environmental awareness. What's happening in the global economy? Let's start there. The first thing, of course, is, and this is good for us in this part of the world as public speakers running our own businesses, is a definite shift from emerging market uh, economies, um, I should say two emerging market economies from the developed economies. More than half of the world's GDP now comes from emerging markets. South Africa is part of that, not that we've got a proud history of GDP at the moment. But our next door neighbors in Africa do have sub sahara Africa, Nigeria, Zambia, Ghana, etc., etc. And we shouldn't be that far behind in time. So <clears throat> this is good for us. What it means is the population of people that we are going to be talking to that want to consume our products is growing all the time. Here's an interesting graph at the bottom over here. Let me just explain it. It's the percentage of the population that is in the working age bracket. Working age bracket defined as 18 to 65. I'm going to talk about the states first. If you go back to 1960, about uh, the percentage of the population in the states that were in the working age bracket was about 62% and it's about 65% now. It hasn't grown and we all know one of the reasons, it's because obviously their population hasn't grown. Similarly in Europe, similarly in most of the developed economies. Have a look however at China, which is just so opposite. Go back to 1960, about 56% of their population were in the working age bracket, it's now 73%. That's because they have this huge boom of young youngsters. I mean, they're curbing that now, but they did have that. South Africa, this is good for us. Go back to 1960, about that South African line there. About 55% of our population was working. It's now 65. That's a big percentage increase. And that's also because, of course, we've got a growing population. Our populations, as I say, are young and gray, but these are the guys that 
are going to be buying our products. These are the guys that are also going to come up with their own innovation. They're going to be providers of capital and talent and those sorts of things. And there's going to be a thirst for knowledge. There's this huge gap between those that know and those that don't know. Actually, it's growing. We have an opportunity here. We actually have knowledge. We can fill that gap. That's part of the opportunities. There are a couple of things, a couple of flags, as uh, <coughs> Clem Sutton would call them, that we need to start to understand. Let's look at the United States firstly. Everybody's heard of quantitative easing, printing of money. It's been massive. For the last few years, the Fed has been buying $85 billion worth of assets from companies, mainly toxic assets, of course. $85 billion a month. That's over a trillion dollars a year. They're pumping cash into the economy. It was the way in which they got through the financial crisis. What it did, of course, is it reduced interest rates right down to next to nothing. The Federal Reserve rate is somewhere between zero and 25 basis points. That's equal to the South African repo rate. Our Reserve Bank repo rate at the moment is 5.75%. It means if we've got a little bit of money and we want to invest it, we don't have to go to the stock exchange, we can invest it and get a real return in an interest-bearing security. You can't do that in the United States. So what's been happening in those economies? The money's come flooding out. It's coming to our economy. It's certainly propped up the RAND. It's propped up the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. But the ink is getting pretty dry on the money making because they started to ease off the pedal from the beginning of this year. It was 85 billion a month. Now in August, it's going to be 25 billion. And they've indicated, has the Fed, that in September and October it's reducing to 15 billion. At some point in time, interest rates in the States are going to rise, their yields on their treasuries and bonds are going to improve, and the money's going to stop coming into South Africa and into emerging economies, and eventually it might be withdrawn. We're years away from that, I think. Our message, obviously, is, is that we're going to make sure that we build a sustainably strong economy before that happens, so that our Iran, Iran doesn't collapse and our stock exchange doesn't Technology is something we should all be aware of. <clears throat> Not the ordinary technology which moves more or less at a slow curve. And those are the needs of people, whether you are a high-end consumer or low-end consumer. Over time, your needs are going to increase. But it's this line over here which is called disruptive. And, and I'm sure David would have heard of disruptive uh, technology uh, or disruptive innovation. These are the technologies that take us by storm. They revolutionize everything that we were used to, and they leave it all behind. We've had so much of that in the last 20 or 30 years. Take your cell phone as a very good example, <clears throat> how that's revolutionized definitely. Some of us, I'm one of those, I don't have a home telephone. I don't need a home telephone. It's changed the whole environment. How about the email? Think about what the email has done to the postal service. We don't post letters to each other any longer. We don't go and buy stamps. We had to do that, of course, in the pre-1980s, pre-1990s even. Just think about computers, how they've replaced these huge, big mainframe computers. Think about internet, Google. We don't go to libraries. When last has anybody been into a library? Anything and everything we need, we get from the internet. So these are technologies that take us by storm. They are disruptive technologies, and more is going to come. <clears throat> as speakers, as running our own businesses, we've got to actually understand these changes in technology, and we've got to move with the times. Maybe your after-dinner speech is not going to be delivered by you. Maybe there'll be a hologram that does all of that. Your words look exactly likely, like you, but you'll be sitting here in Durban. We've got to keep in touch with those things. <coughs> Let's talk about the South African economy. <coughs> things are not bright for us at the moment. We've got this, what they call the supply side constraints. I'll give you some examples. Electricity, there isn't enough hampers business. Transport isn't good enough. It's hampering our business. We all know about the labor unrest. What happened this year in the platinum industry? The miners went on strike for five months. Do you know what the cost was? <coughs> the income to the platinum mine, <coughs> mining companies? 35 billion rand lost. That's not good for our economy, is it? Well, they pulled out of the country, didn't they? Some of the well, we've, we've, had some, yes, we've had some people pull their research decide not to actually come invest their research into our country. Obviously very high unemployment, 
the problem of the unemployment is not just that it's 25%, it's what it is in the at youth level. It's more like 50 and 60% at youth level. That is absolutely awful in terms of our economy. And of course, the, the consumer is still stressed. Who was it uh, who said earlier about um, microloans? I think it was Ron. So what happened after the financial crisis is that uh, the unsecured lending industry boomed. People like African Bank that have just gone into curatorship. They've got an unsecured lending book of 60 billion rand. Most of that was built up from 2008 to the beginning of this year. 60 billion rand. Capitex not far behind. They charge interest at 30% and more. Okay? So there's a little bit of an immoral part of it as well. But what the consumers did is they went and they grabbed as much as they could. The credit was lax, but the consumers have got themselves overstressed. The RAND is extremely volatile, and of course we're exposed to that investor sentiment that I spoke of earlier. I don't think there's an immediate concern, provided we can keep that sort of stuff in check. There's no immediate concern of huge outflows of money. Stagflation. I just want to explain stagflation because somebody said to me the other day, but our inflation rate is only 6.7%. That's not high, is it? So how can it be called stagflation? <clears throat> stagflation is a term that is used when you've got much lower growth than inflation. And that's what we have in this country. The expectation for GDP for this year is 1.7%. Last year it was 2.2%. In terms of the running year up to the end of the first quarter of this year, it's 1.7, at 1.8. And our inflation has gone through to 6.7. There's a 5 percentage points difference. That is called stagflation. It's very difficult to deal with. And one of the reasons for that is monetary policy says when you've got high inflation, you increase interest rates. But interest rates, if they go up, dampen growth. If you've got low growth, there's nothing to dampen. You're doomed if you do and doomed if you don't. <coughs> so interest rates are going to go up, probably gradually, but it is going to add to the stress of the consumer. And of course, we all know what rating agencies do. Moody's last week, without even going to visit Capitec, downgraded them two notches. After the African bank fiasco, Moody's downgraded some of our money market funds in South Africa. They're never going to lose money for anybody. Downgraded them by a few notches. The EPSA money market fund, Investec Asset Management money market fund, Standard, they were all downgraded by these dratted uh, rating agencies. If they do that to South Africa, it can also, of course, be make us vulnerable. If they downgrade us to below investment quality, there will be an outflow of money. More importantly, there won't be any more money coming in. But this is actually not all that bad because we should be looking for opportunities. <clears throat> That's what a squirrel would do. would look for opportunities arising from this volatile environment. Private business always does. They always find a way. It's going to happen. Private business is going to seek knowledge. It's going to look to innovate around this unstable and rapidly changing environment. The PSA, us, our people, here, around the country, we have got an abundant amount of knowledge and lots of imagination. It's an opportunity for us. We've got to identify our particular skills, where that particular changing environment needs it, and go and peddle them there. Those opportunities do exist, and they will continue to exist. Skill resources are going to be required to navigate through the noise of some of these troubles. We have got those skills. Again, in abundance, more opportunities for us. And at the same time, we might be able to take advantage of government incentives for creating, for creating employment. The other thing I think we should consider is diversifying. We have got these other growing, emerging markets in Sub-Saharan Africa. If we've got skills, we don't have to peddle them only in South Africa. We can take them to these other growing economies. They will have a, a big thirst for them because they actually lack so many of the skills which we have in Africa in South Africa. So we can think of diversifying, either to companies that have got branches or other companies that they control in the rest of Africa, or find your own companies to go and seek out opportunities. I've mentioned before, these are some of the growing emerging markets. Zambia, Nigeria, Ghana, excellent. And Zimbabwe, <coughs> once <coughs> Bob Mugabe's gone, actually will also be in the mix. All right, so that's, that's looking at the environmental environmental awareness. Now let's have a look at moderation. Despite the temptation, as I said earlier, a squirrel will never eat every nut that falls from the tree. That's a fact. Moderation. 
I think we've got to start practicing that as well. We didn't see that from people who own their own businesses through the financial crisis. That's not the most recent experience that we've had, not just in South Africa, but around the world. If I have a look at my company, through the credit crisis, self-employed, like us, they were the biggest defaulters on home loans, so this is on secured assets. So our book of people that are permanently employed, our default levels went up to 5% of the book, in terms of self-employed, it went to 11% of the book, more than double the people that were employed. And why is that? Well, <clears throat> it's easy actually. Everybody's tendency, every single individual's tendency is to adjust their lifestyle in line with their current income. Not their future income expectations, not their past income, but with their current income. In boom times, of course, it means current income went up and people uh, adjusted their lifestyle upwards. That's exactly what happened. I can actually show it to you on a graph. These are some assumptions, okay? I've assumed that an average earnings per <coughs> month is 60,000 Rand. I've assumed, of course, that we've gone through this economic cycle over here, which we really did go through in 2008 and 2009. Let's say that the average is 60,000. Back, you know, in 2004, you were earning 45,000 a month and it went up to 100,000. But it was going to always plunge. We all have a sense of what we know our average earnings to be. But what happened at the peak, of course, is that people adjusted their lifestyle to that peak of earnings. They spent more. They took on debt, which that level of earnings could afford. You know, if you're earning 60,000 or 50,000 Rand a month, maybe you can afford a home loan of 1.5 million. If you're earning 100,000, you're going to afford a home loan of 3 million. People were taking big loans at that level. And then, of course, the market crashed, and they had to start to default. They were able maybe to adjust their lifestyle, but the debt that they'd taken on was from the peak, and they defaulted. That's one of the reasons why it went bad. What would a squirrel do? I said earlier, practice moderation. The squirrel is going to save any amount above the average and utilize that saving in the downturn. Get through the bad times. That's what we should be doing. It's a very important point, because it's so against everything that we seem to have been created for. We overspend to change our lifestyles when we really shouldn't be. Let's talk about conservative borrowing. <clears throat> this is in the time of crisis when the tree has been cut down, the poor squirrel's uh, nuts are gone, he has to go to a partner, but he lives. He lives in terms of those borrowed nuts of almost nothing just sufficient to live. That's their natural instinct. Now that's what we should be doing as well. Conservative borrowing. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to be asking Roger very soon for his credit card. Uh, based on what he said earlier. But it goes like this. So history of course shows us that as our lifestyle goes to this higher earnings level, so does our appetite for debt. We have a much bigger appetite for debt as our prospects improve. And the risk is that we determine what we can afford based on our highest earnings and not on our average earnings or our lowest earnings. Some people aren't like that. I remember not too long ago talking to Clay, and you made that point exactly to me, which was, you know, you want to actually make sure that whatever payments you're going to make if you were going to buy a house would be at a lower level of earnings expectations. You're one of the rare people. Most people don't do that. They will base their affordability on their highest possible level of course, when your earnings drop, we've already discussed, you can change your lifestyle, but you can't change your debt. And that leads to the sinking of the ship. And then, the interesting thing is the reaction when the ship is sinking. Most people then go and seek further loans. Generally, it's been these unsecured loans of 30% and more. That doesn't help you at all. That helps to sink the ship even faster. So, of course, just so that you know, <coughs> companies like mine have learned these lessons. So when a self-employed now comes along to seek a home loan, we actually apply what we call a haircut to their earnings. It doesn't matter, you can show, show us one year's worth of earnings, we're going to always apply a haircut. We're going to make the assumption that we're going to go through an economic downturn and your income levels are going to fall. And we're going to ask for a larger deposit. So whereas somebody who's got a permanent job can get a 100% home loan, and they can, somebody who's self-employed 
has to put in 15%, will only give them a maximum of 85% of the value of the house they purchase. These are realities that we need to understand running our own businesses. Squirrel behavior continued. I always say to anybody, you're the only one who actually really understands your business and what you're capable of earning and what your average level of earnings are. You are the one that can make that determination. You know what your long-term earnings potential is and whether you're ahead of the, of the curve or below the curve at the moment. That is what you should be using to determine affordability. Absolutely. is what you really expect your earnings will be over the next X number of years going forward. Also, you're the only person that can make your best assessment of what your necessary living expenses are. In other words, that all comes down to the affordability of the installments. Do it. But more importantly, only take on good, what I call necessary debt. Now, necessary debt is there, obviously, to allow for the purchase of large assets. Assets sometimes in inverted commas. Houses and cars. That's the only way in which you're actually going to be able to acquire them is to actually get financing. So apply those conservative affordability issues that I've been talking about over there and don't overspend. Don't buy a house that you don't think you're going to be able to afford two or three years out. Don't buy a big flashy car unless you can afford it. If you have excess cash, always pay off your most expensive debt. So you pay off a car before the house or if you have an unsecured loan, the unsecured loan before the car before the house and so on and so forth. But have a look at that point over there, which I often do try to emphasize to people. Credit cards, store cards, they should be used for transactional ease only. That's it. You should never, ever carry a balance for it. As soon as you do, it attracts a very high rate of interest. That's the problem. So for transactional ease, absolutely. We don't actually, and for security, we don't want to walk around with a wallet full of notes. So walk around with store cards and credit cards, but pay them off. Know that you can pay them off. I don't think there's any exceptions that should be made to any of that. No personal, no microloans, no overdraft facilities, no unpaid credit card balances. No exceptions at all. And the reason is because if you are taking those unsecured short-term loans, it's indicating that your lifestyle exceeds your income. Because you have to pay it back. You have to pay it back. You have to pay it back out of your future lifestyle, future earnings. So don't take on that debt, particularly not when they can carry interest rates in excess of 30%. Saving. What are my hobby horses? That's what the squirrel does. Always make sure that there are sufficient nuts to live off during the winter. Always. They save, they save enough. We don't. But in order to ensure a comfortable future, we've got to look at two things. One, the protection of your current wealth. And secondly, looking at your future wealth. Let's talk about your current wealth. It is so easy to erode current wealth. It's the easiest thing to do. There are big ticket items that we can go and buy out there from things like motor cars or very expensive overseas trips, suites at hotels, etc., etc. Excessive lifestyle is the biggest danger living beyond your means to erode your current wealth. Excessive debt, either long term or short term in particular. A lack of safeguards against unforeseen expenditure it can happen. Medical is important. Insurance is important. These big things can and do happen to lots of people. And if they don't have that cover, it erodes their current wealth. And of course, as I say, there's also an incorrect understanding of investments in assets. Assets, as far as I'm concerned, are things that produce cash flow. A car is actually a liability, not an asset. Simple as that. So understand that when you're going to allocate monies to the acquisition of the motor vehicle. Let's talk about future wealth. Oopsie. Future wealth and well-being can be eroded through lots of things. A lack of strategy to ensure sustainable income. We're often caught in that trap. If we want to be in this business, we actually must have a strategy. We should have a business plan. We should be writing it down. We should make sure that we can ensure that we really do have a sustainable flow of annuity income. By that I mean monthly, quarterly, whatever it is, regular. If we can't do that, we can't be in this business, guys. It's as simple as that. If we can't cut it, we can't be here. But I think we can cut it, because you can apply your mind to it. It's not woe is me. It's sitting down saying how, where, why. What are my skills? Where are those opportunities? We must produce those business plans. Lack of retirement savings is a chronic problem right throughout the world. 
if you have a look in South Africa, Alexander Forbes tell us that the magical equation is that when you retire, you want to be able to have about, in spending or in earnings, about 75% of the income that you're earning prior to your retirement. In terms of retirement savings of funds that they administer, less than 15% of people in this country are able to get <coughs> to that level. 85% can't. Lack of retirement savings. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Also, it's terrible. They're going to be changing legislation sh shortly, not too soon uh, for my liking. People withdraw their existing retirement savings. Now, I'll give you another statistic. In my company, we of course know what people do with their retirement savings when they leave us because we have to process it either to a preservation fund or into their bank account. 95% of people in my turnover that leave ESSA home loans cash in their retirement savings and spend it. They start again from zero. Poor investment strategies, I'll come to that in a moment. I know and I can give, but I think I'm going to be running out of time. So I'm going to give too many examples, but I can, of people that have not in fact gone to professionals. They've taken advice from friends, they've taken advice from somebody in the corner cafe, and they've lost all their money. You mustn't do that. Those are really poor investment strategies. And of course, as I said before, a lack of safety guard against unforeseen things. I'm going to stay on squirrel behavior for current wealth and future wealth. How do you protect your current wealth? Well, live within your means. Take on only good debt. As I say, I'm starting to sound like a stuck gramophone record, but I'm doing it on purpose because I need that people to understand that. We make that mistake time and time again, even though we have the warnings. Having easily accessible savings. Now, this is not retirement savings. This is when you have times of plenty, make sure that you save. You must be able to access as well in the times of need. You need medical aid and medical expense gap cover for yourself and your family. Must doesn't have to be doesn't have to be more than a hospital plan, but you have to have it. And you know, make sure that you've got insurance on major assets, houses and cars. There's so many sob stories. I'm sure lots of you know of people that didn't take cover, house burns down, or the breadwinner uh, uh, dies and the family have to leave the house poverty stricken. You must make sure that you have insurance. <coughs> the future wealth is going to be protected by you know, a proper planned approach to generating annuity income for people like ourselves, self-employed. Invest in yourself as well. Your future wealth is protected by investing in yourself. We know what education we need, what additional skills we should be acquiring. We must be prepared to spend that, prepared to spend that money to invest in ourselves so that we can actually earn an income based on those additional skills. I've spoken already about a business plan. And obviously you must invest excess cash in assets which will give you this annuity stream that's going to tide you through the tough times. Retirement savings. So this is the formula. They, tell, they actually say that if you invest 15% of your monthly salary for 35 years, you're going to get to that magical figure of 75% of salary post-retirement. You don't need much more than that because, you know, if you've got 100 and you're already contributing 50, that's down to 85, and then there are supposedly some savings you can make when you retire. That's 15% for 35 years. Of course, if you're going to save for less than 35 years, that 15% has to be a higher number. 15% happens to be a nice number at the moment because there are <coughs> very, very nice taxation advantages associated with that. So I'm saying, of course, if your earnings are variable, your 15% should be based on your average earnings assess your average earnings all the time. Compounding is the key. The earlier you start saving for your retirement, the better it is. No question about it. I think I might go to the bottom point. The better late than never does apply. I've spoken to people in the past who said, well, I'm 50. I've never provided for my retirement. It's too late now. That's not the case, actually. It's absolutely not the case. Because having something is better than nothing. All that you need to do is you need to actually save at higher percentages of the 15 to give yourself something. Um, there are tax incentives. Currently, it's 15% of income. I think you probably all know that. The important thing is to make sure you use it to the full. So if you're contributing monthly, RAs and those sorts of things, come the end of the tax year, at the end of February, understand what your full income is, work out the 15%, and any shortfall, pump it in to another RA. 
the taxation consequences, as I say, or advantages are very profound. They are. The retirement contribution uh, industry and reform is coming. The first thing that they're going to be doing, as I hope very hastily, is preventing excessive retirement saving withdrawals. But here's the biggie. They're going to allow tax deduction for retirement savings to move up from 15% <coughs> to 27.5%. That means the people that haven't been saving for their retirements have an opportunity to invest at higher percentages with tax deductibility, tax advantages. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs>